I mean, just think how much poorer we would be today if the world had had half as many people in the 19th century as it actually did. You can get rid of either Thomas Edison or Louis Pasteur. Take your pick. Hi, I'm Matt Welch for Reason TV. I am joined today by Dr. Robert Zubrin, author of the new book, Merchants of Despair, Radical Environmentalists, Criminal Pseudoscientists, and the Fatal Cult of Anti-Humanism. Robert, thank you for joining us today. Thanks for inviting me. Why are we, 40 years after you know the population bomb and a lot of the uh, kind of uh, most dystopian environmentalists, why go after the hyperbole of activists in 2012? because they're still with us. Uh, you know, look, we have never been in danger of running out of resources, but we have encountered considerable danger from people who say we're running out of resources and who say that human activities need to be constrained because there isn't enough to go around and so someone's got to be put in control. Okay, this has been a threat for some time and what I do in the book Merchants of Despair is go through the history of this movement over 200 years and show the horrendous results of, of, of their activities where they've been successful. Now we've seen, you know, history of of uh, uh, eugenics and, and a lot of uh, really just sort of nasty, awful stuff. In the year 2012, where is this formulating policy? Where is where are threats arising from these kind of, as you described them, anti-humanist tendencies? Well. Uh, among the ongoing programs that they have are population control programs, which involve the forced sterilization of millions of women every year. Where's that happening? Uh, Africa, South America, India, Indonesia, and, and, and that's under uh, U.S. pressure and in China under their own pressure. So the U.S. is pressuring Indonesia to engage in forced sterilization. It's a condition of getting foreign aid funds. In the 1960s, remnants of the pre-war eugenics movement reorganized around uh, the slogan of population control. And uh, they always fit their uh, ideas to f fit the time. So they said population control was necessary to win the Cold War, that excessive growth of population in the third world would provide masses for the communist world revolution. And so that uh, the U.S. should make population control part of its uh, foreign policy. And in 1966, laws were passed that uh, mandated that U.S. foreign aid funds should be linked to population control. The Johnson administration denied famine aid to India in 1967 unless Indira Gandhi implemented forced sterilization programs, which she did. And uh, this was then done in, in many other countries with horrific consequences. Uh, in every place where it's been implemented, it's always the, the dominant race in the local place doing it to the subservient race, the Brahmins against the untouchables in Ceylon, the Sinhalese against the Tamils in Peru. Uh, it, this has been uh, horrific, and it is still going on. Uh, and so, it's still conditional of, of USA. You, you have to have forced sterilization in order to get this money in 2012. You have to have population control programs, right. which typically have involved forced sterilization, or most typically what they've involved is quotas for the governments involved, so that these programs are top-down mandated, and then the people at the lower level, in order to meet their quotas, will figure uh, out their own. Figure out how to do it, whether it is forced sterilization, whether it is denying uh, benefits like public schooling, public health to people who don't go along, uh, or lying to um, you know not terribly well-educated women, you know, telling them that this is a reversible operation. Uh, offering cash incentives to people who are very poor. Okay, so this is the population control. Then we have uh, the general impairment of economic development due to environmentalist activity across a, a range of things, uh, from nuclear power to genetically modified foods to drilling for oil. And, and, and now, of course, most recently, we have the proposal that human uh, uh, industrial activity should be limited to stop global warming. Uh, that's kind of failing, or at least as, as the current sort of treaty status uh, and trying to get India and China on, on board of this thing, it's reaching a roadblock. It's not like it's going further under the Obama administration than it did under George W. Bush. Is the threat more what could happen later, or is it how it's translating in other kind of non-treaty level global warming kind of policies? Well, the only reason why it hasn't gone forward in the United States is because the Republicans won the election in 2010. What if they lose the election this year? Uh, you know, you have a movement here which is committed to uh, giving the government the power to ration the use of fire. This is a menace, and to, to count upon uh, 
a fortunate election being repeated endlessly uh, would be uh, folly. I grew up in Southern California, couldn't see the mountains when I was a kid. We can see the mountains now. Isn't some of that regulation based or environmental policy kind of central command based results? Uh, yeah. Now, there, there's a distinction to be made between practical environmentalism, which wants to, for instance, stop people from dumping industrial waste into the reservoir. Okay, Th That is necessary to preserve uh, a sound living environment for people. And ideological environmentalism, which seeks to use instances of human damage to the environment, whether real or imagined, to further the case for the prosecution that humans are vermin, they're wrecking the world, and they've got to be put under control, and so somebody's got to be put in control. Those are two different things. With respect to regulations that are necessary, they should simply be outcome-based. They should simply say uh, that you can't put this more than this much nitric out, uh, acid up your smokestack. They should not tell you how to run your factory. You know. Uh, there are ways you can modify automobiles right now very easily to make them be able to get much more mileage, to be able to run on alternate fuels such as methanol that are much cheaper and be less polluting at the same time. They are illegal under the Clean Air Act because the Environmental Protection Agency will tell you that you're tampering with a pollution control device. And if you say to them, well, I'll take the car in for emissions testing and show you that it's cleaner than your standards, they say, we don't care. And that's generally the uh, approach taken in environmental regulation, right? It's here is the method and also the destination as opposed to just reach these targets by whatever non-coercive you know, coercive or non-violent right. theme. And, theme and, and by so doing that, they are actually crippling the ability of people to improve the environment. Uh, final question. There's, in a lot of the sort of discussion about, uh, about environmental policy, it boils down to or feels like it boils down to between people who say this exists and people who say it doesn't exist or it's being exaggerated, whether it's global warming or whether it's, it's you know, a population bomb or other types of things. Do you think that that framing, if it's indeed true, has, has allowed for free market solutions to legitimate environmental problems taking a back seat? Well, uh, in general, their desire to control everything from the top has impaired numerous technologies that could improve the environment. Nuclear power, for example. Uh, you know, I used to work in the nuclear industry and there was one plant that was having a certain problem which we knew exactly how to correct, but we couldn't do it. The NRC wouldn't let us because it meant deviating from their, their uh, regulations. Uh, genetically modified crops. Uh, they have genetically modified crops now that can produce their own pesticides and fix their own nitrates. So you don't need to spray pesticides into the environment and you don't need to uh, scatter nitrate fertilizer on the land. They won't let you do it. Look, a lot of things they say are happening but are not problems. Population growth is happening. It's not a problem. The world standard of living has gone up as population has increased. And not coincidentally, it means a larger market which allows people to introduce new technologies faster, a larger division of labor, a larger number of inventors coming up with new uh, uh, technologies. I mean, just think how much poorer we would be today if the world had had half as many people in the 19th century as it actually did. You can get rid of either Thomas Edison or Louis Pasteur. Take your pick. Okay? You know, and if these people had been in power, if Malthus had had his way, and we could have limited the world's population to the one billion people that there were in the year 1800. An immense amount of human progress that we're benefiting from today would never have happened. So once again, we're not in danger from running out of resources. We're in danger from people who say we got to be constrained because we're allegedly running out of resources. We're not in danger from global warming. We're in danger from people who say we have to be put under tyrannical governments to avoid global warming. We're not in danger from lack of Lebensraum. Where we've been in danger from people who said they needed Lebensraum. Okay? It's, it's always the same thing. The fundamental argument they have is there isn't enough to go around, therefore human aspirations must be constrained, therefore someone must be empowered to do the constraining, and we volunteer for that difficult task. On that optimistic and pessimistic note, I am Matt Welch for Reason TV. Thank you. <laughs>